going to speak on the fission and fusion, the concept of fission and fusion in the European context relating to peace, security, and migrations. Um, when I borrowed the science term, phrase, fission and fusion, used by Evans Pritchard in his work on the New World tribe of southern Sudan, it hardly occurred to me, actually, that there would be anything like Brexit and that Britain would ever vote to walk away from, EU, uh, from the EU membership. But then this is what happened, actually. And, and I believe that the most overt reason for the supporters of this move revolves around issues of migration and security. Whatever causes that induce migration, there is always a definite relationship with peace and security, whether that be political, social, or economic in nature. However, the most important single factor that has observed that has been observed in recent years, leading to large-scale migrations, particularly from developing countries to developed countries, is that of political unrest leading to serious peace and security infringements in home countries. The influx of migrants to European countries in recent years has created serious multidimensional problems that in turn raise paradoxical issues within EU member countries, thus creating a catch, something like a catch-22 situation. On one hand, while the presence of migrants in huge numbers, both skilled and unskilled, would provide cheap labor for which Europe is surely in dire need, it also created or creates, on the other hand, more deeper unemployment crisis leading to overwhelming dissatisfaction and unhealthy competition within local labor markets. The immediate reaction against the migrants is evidence in this soaring of hate crimes, political unrest, threatening imbalance in the socio-economic fabric of these societies, I mean the host countries. Further paradox I observed, or is observed, is also observable in the current moral stance within these European societies towards these migrants. On one hand, these societies feel that they have moral obligation to help those in need. But extending help to continuous flow of thousands of migrants, asylum seekers, refugees, is such an onerous obligation that comes with serious socio-political repercussions within these host countries. Most of the EU member countries have reached a point in which the only option left to them is say, enough is enough. The, some of the countries even within the EU, they believe that still Europe still has an obligation, moral obligation to extend its hand to the, uh, to the refugees. Ladies and gentlemen, it is worth pointing out that there exists a good number of international and regional agreements enforceable within EU for the protection of migrants and refugees. These laws are further augmented by customary international law norms relating to human rights, international humanitarian issues, human trafficking, right of non-nationals, and asylum procedures, among others. However, and this is a very crucial point. However, these laws seem to be inadequate in handling the current migration crisis in EU. Thus, and despite the existence of these laws, destination countries started not only to send back refugees or at times treat them in unpredictable and inhumane manners, but also have sought measures to prevent refugee advancements into their countries. Needless to say, the influx of migrants to Europe have resulted in two important developments. First, it led to the rise of hostile and chauvinistic attitude towards migrants. Second, the latter situation necessarily warranted for a serious reconsideration of relevant laws and policies concerning migration to Europe. However, 
The problem of inadequacy of laws is also seen squarely in the failure of these laws to provide satisfactory protection to the EU citizens against those recalcitrant migrants who bring and tend to solve to resolve their political differences and cultural differences in their own way, the way they were doing in their own countries. The way they were doing and settling their problems, definitely, when they apply these kind of solving problems in Europe, definitely it will not be acceptable to the Europeans. It is ironically noticed that those very people who came running for security, running for peace, running for better life, they are the same people who are creating the same insecurity and in the newfound place or in the host countries. It is really uh, important to point out that there is a cyclical relationship between peace, security, and migrations. Um, the number of international migrants seem to be growing faster than the world's population, the fact of which would eventually result in an increment in the share of migrants in the global population, which actually reached to 3.3% in 2015 compared to 2.8% in the year 2000. Don't worry about this big bundle actually, it's just I'm jumping all these, so don't worry about it. <laughs> the, I want to mention the relationship that I mentioned about peace, security and migrations and the, uh, the, the, the existing legal initiatives that present in, in Europe. International migration law and refugee policy is predicated upon Article 14 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, which recognizes the right of persons to seek asylum from persecution in other countries. The laws and policies of the EU on asylum and refugee has been codified in several protocols, regulations, and directives. In addition, the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights have also helped to develop legal sense towards migrants. More specifically, the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees serves the basis for the protection of refugees and asylum seekers. Under the EU refugee and asylum law framework, there are comprehensive and specific provisions on issues affecting refugee and forced migrants. Such include access to territory of procedures, status of refugees and documentation, asylum uh, determination and barriers to removal, procedural safeguard, safeguard and legal support, private and family rights, detention and restriction of movement, issues on forced return, economic and social rights, and right of persons with specific needs. Furthermore, the right to asylum of any person who entered the Schengen border is guaranteed under Article 18 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. The European Court of Hum for Human Rights decision in the case of Amour against France in 1976 prohibits the detention of any person in transit zone. Such detention is considered to be a deprivation of liberty. In addition, Article 3 of the European Court of Human Rights prohibits the torture of migrants, of immigrants, or refugees while in transit. Under the provision of Schengen Border Code, Article 12 guides against expulsion of refugees <coughs> on the high seas. This was the basis of the decision in, Har in Hiris, Jama, against Italy, where the Italian Coast Guard intercepted a group of 200 migrants on the high seas. I mean, this is a very famous case, which most of them were Libyans. And those, I think, uh, some of them, they said that some Sudanese were on board. Um, but then what happened is that the court uh, decided that pushing back at sea was considered by court a violation of freedom of migrant and a breach of the human rights. The decision also established the right of refugee to seek remedies under EU uh, under EU regulations. In the case of migrants fleeing conflict and war, EU laws guarantees that states have a limited right to decide whether 
to grant these them to grant them access into EU. Such decision must be respected uh, EU laws and the and the European Court of Human Rights and other human rights provisions. Importantly, there are limitations under EU laws on the right of states to deny or turn away migrants at its borders, particularly with respect to forced, to forced migrants. Now, let us go back and see the nature and condition of migrants are also part of the consideration in granting residence and asylum in the EU. The categories of migrants include asylum seekers, recognized refugees, victims of trafficking, persons affected by Rule 39, and migrants in irregular situation, among others. The EU derived uh, directive of 200, uh, 204, uh, 2004 on resident permit for victims of anti-trafficking Directive provides that personal situation of the victims should warrant that they be given residence permit. According to the European Committee of Social Rights, certain rights are accruable to irregular migrants. These rights include the right to medical assistance, right to shelter, and the right for education. Ladies and gentlemen, if we notice in the current situation, you will notice that the, there is a breakdown of EU refugee policy, which has affected the principle and concept of non-refoulement. What do we mean, or what is meant by non-refoulement, is a concept in refugee law, which prohibits returning of refugees or asylum seekers to a country or territories where risk or threat exists towards his or her life and freedom. The territory within the meaning of non-refoulement could include the home country or any other country deemed to be unfavorable to the life of the refugee. This principle, which is based on Article, 20, uh, on Article 33 of the Geneva Convention and the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees and its 1967 protocol, has been found to be a cornerstone of refugee protection. Under EU laws, Article 77, uh, 78 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union incorporates the principle of non-refoulement in accordance with its application under the Geneva Convention. With the ongoing migrant crisis, it is apparent that states in the EU are acting in violation of its own laws. It has also become clear that some of the states are actually not well equipped to cater for the influx of huge numbers of refugees. This has been resulted, this has resulted in the Hungary, in Hungary building a fence to dissuade migrants from its borders heading towards other EU neighbors such as Romania and Croatia. This singular act of barring entry of refugees implied a total breakdown of the Dublin regulation that requires a member state to, to examine asylum applications and documents and documents before taking any action towards them. To this end, the EU legal framework for refugee has failed and few countries have called for the indefinite suspension of Dublin regulation on reception of refugees and asylum seekers. Also, under threat is the Schengen Agreement on border control within the EU. The violation of non-refoulement principle is another justification to assert the inability of the EU to handle the exodus of refugees. Ladies and gentlemen, the EU Commission recommendation on European resettlement scheme was adopted in 1915 after over a million migrants had entered the EU region in search of better life after their countries have been ravaged with civil wars and poor living standards. The general spirit of the scheme is reflected in the conclusion of the Justice and Home Affairs Council of 10th October 14, where it was acknowledged that Quote, while taking into account the efforts carried out by member states affected by migrant, 
uh, migratory flows. All member states should give their contribution to, resett to resettlement in a fair and balanced manner. To actualize this, an EU-wide resettlement scheme was being considered based on distribution by car, by distribution key laid down in the EU recommendation as contain, contained in the scheme. Paragraphs four, five, and six of the scheme provides a thus. Paragraph four says, the scheme should consist of a single European pledge of 20,000 uh, euros, uh, resettle, uh, 20,000 uh, members, you know, resettlement places for persons to be resettled. The duration of the scheme should be two years from the date of adoption of the recommendation. This is number four. The directive number five, the overall pledged settlement, resettlement places, should be allocated to member states in accordance with the distribution key in the annex. In case associated states decide to participate in the scheme, the distribution key would be adapted accordingly. Six, the priority regions for resettlement should include North Africa, the Middle East, and the Horn of Africa, focusing in particular on the countries where the regional development and protection recommendations are implemented. Then, since the recommendations are not considered in any way a legally binding document on the EU member states, the above scheme was proved to be unsuccessful. Henceforth, different countries preferred to manage migrant crisis and its consequential effects of increasing spates of insecurity in their own unique ways. Accordingly, with Brexit becoming the first aftermath of the, of the EU migrant crisis, it is not surprising for the EU to try to reconsider a change to the existing asylum rules by introducing a compulsory quota system. The EU members will be required to accept a specific quota, as mentioned, of refugees agreed upon in the alternative by ready by to, in alternative, in alternative, be ready to pay a stipulated penalty for the resettlement of allocated migrants elsewhere. elsewhere. So the, it's agreed that the directive say that there is a quota for each state, European state, in order to accept, say, for example, 20,000 refugees. If they fail to do though, so, they have to pay fine for that. Now, the post, the post Brexit European migrant challenges may perhaps trigger further exits from, uh, from EU and might ultimately lead to the collapse of EU if other more sustainable policies, structures, and modalities are not explored. The Prime Minister of Hungary emphasized this recently when he ominously reported that, retorted that. We need, quote, we need to fight to prove to people that it is possible to form an EU migrant policy that is in line with the Hungarian national policies or national interest. This is going to be a long struggle for which I will need a strong mandate, which cannot be ensured without a referendum. This is another gentleman, another, the, the other, other, another gentleman retorted this, which is the Slovak Prime Minister, said, quote, he expressed the set, set, I mean, similar sentiment. We have a big problem with the proposed reform of the Dublin system. We think it's stupid because this is exactly what will keep divided, dividing Europe if countries will be asked to pay 250,000 euros for each migrant they refuse to take. So you could see the problem that is happening within the European communities based on whatever that directives that were issued in Dublin. They call it Dublin directives. The question whether is whether the EU can legally prescribe a mandatory resettlement of non-citizens of a country without the consent of the parliament of that country. This remains to be answered. And of course, it is, it is a very, very interesting because this is the point in which most European countries, they are trying to, 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 to. it's a kind of a defiance because this is definitely touches upon the sovereignty of the individual countries. 
Now, what are the kind of reforms that one expects in the legal arena in order to help the both sides, I mean the European, the EU communities and those uh, migrants? It is typical for countries to explore solutions which only benefit their citizens without necessarily considering the plight of others. And I think this is, this is one of the points that was mentioned by Professor that, that people have to think for the others rather than you think inwardly. This has been the driving force of most foreign policies of some developed countries. Nevertheless, the repercussions of such a one-way straight-jacketed foreign policy are usually ill-informed and often reactionary. Rather than concentrating on one's country or region, it is possible to explore a two-way reform programs where both the, the developed country and the original home country of the migrants are targeted to manage the migration crisis. I mean, I mean this, is, this is actually a very interesting because uh, currently we see that, say, people coming from Iraq, from Syria, from Syria, from Sudan, from, they come here and they expect the developed countries to help. They themselves, they do not do much. They don't do much in order to help themselves. So the best thing to do, even for the, for the, for the European countries or developed countries, in order to help themselves, they have to develop the two-way development develop their own countries, and at the same time, develop the countries of the origin where the migrants are coming, so that they will try to keep them there, or at least send them without, uh, I mean, without putting them into any greater risks. In almost every developed country, there are numerously high, numerous highly skilled expatriates in different fields of their endeavors, as well as unskilled migrants. In both, if both are properly handled, they could be a good addition to the human wealth of the host country. But if the same are mishandled, then definitely they could well become a menacing source to the country, I mean to the host country's insecurity. Sending them back to their home country without helping to solve the root causes for their migration is tantamount to inviting them to return to the host country by using different entry, entry tactics. And this happens quite a lot. You know, you send someone who is unsuccessful there, he will try and try and try until he gets, uh, succeeds in order to leave his own country to go to the, where he finds a better life. It is a fact that migrants to Europe come from countries with different social, political, cultural, and religious, uh, religious backgrounds. They come to Europe carrying with them their differences, and sometimes they do not hesitate to solve their disagreements, as I said before, in the most violent ways as they used to do in their home countries. Such practices in form is found alien and acceptable to most European societies, since by doing, they are disturbing peace and create sense of insecurity within the host community. Now, the fission and fusion, as I said, factor created by the presence of alien bodies in the society would surely give rise, on one hand, to a heightened sense of insecurity, which would engender resistance as a general reaction from the host community. The migrants, on the other hand, would, feel, would also feel insecure as a result of unfavorable reactions from the members of the host community. In a recent Financial Times report, it was reported that Germany currently fears, fears what it considered as the influence of homegrown militants on Muslim migrants, particularly the Syrian migrants. The fear is that homegrown militants are recruiting and radicalizing Sunni Muslims from Syria, a development that could complicate efforts to integrate the newcomers and pose a long-term threat to Germany's security. Similar concerns have been raised in various European countries and the United Kingdom. But one thing that is not often emphasized is the fact that migrants also feel insecure in the host communities. To overcome these mutual fears, the host countries should develop programs in collaboration with selected expatriates uh, who will be able to engage with the migrants in the host countries. Like whatever Prof was saying, I think if these programs they invite the expatriates who are of this country, you find them in, like for example, Sudanese, you, you have a development, you have, you have activities 
if, if, if you invite the Sudanese expatriates, who are most of them, some of them are very, very well equipped and well skilled, and some of them they studied even in UK. If you involve them, call them from on board to be take part in your programs, they will be, they can create a better communication with the people from their own countries. The also, I don't know how much is left for me. Five minutes. Oh, that's pretty little. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, 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 there is, I, I think I, I, I'll jump some of the issues. There is one important point which I want to say that there must be an effective filtering system. The current filtering system is haphazard, and I think we need to have a, a good filtering system in order to allow those, rather than sending them, whoever comes, you send them away. I think you need to screen and to have a better way of screening and allowing these people. The filtering process may involve the following preliminary three steps, which may enhance the further improve the country. Respect the principle of non-refoulement, positive profiling, and targeted training programs. Okay, let, let me now jump to the conclusion Uh, there is an issue of inverted transfer of knowledge in which you know you need to train those who are with them and then take them back home in order to uh, to develop their own country and definitely if a peace is created and stability whether economic or social or political definitely you will not have enough uh, enough, enough uh, many 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 refugees coming back now if five minutes, I, I'll go straight to the uh, a suggestion here on the yes. The suggestion is how to create something which I call the international commission for the development, the policies include setting clear criteria for the filtering system, which inwardly, and then to create United Nations Commission on Resettlement and International Development. This is really very important because if you have an independent body uh, to recruit, I mean to filter, to see whatever that is happening legally, I think that could be a very, very good system if, if, if that can be created by the Europeans or by the United Nations. Let us conclude this excursion by posing some legitimate, though simple questions. Most of us think that uh, help, but uh, we need help, but most of us have no clear idea about what sort of help is actually needed to overcome the problem of peace and insecurity caused by the political uh, unrest in all these countries. It is not better it is not better to tackle the root, it is better to tackle the root causes of the problem and stem eradicate it, the, the, the source. What should Europe do in order to protect its, uh, it, to be protected, to protect and protect it? Because Europe needs to protect itself and also at the same time needs to protect the refugees. There is need to seriously devise a mechanism to help these migrants to return to their home countries. It is a fact that some successful immigrants in UK or Europe countries did so well because they have obtained, it's not, it's not that they did well, it's not because they did well, and that was not because they are, they are British citizens or Germans or whatever, but they had the capability to flourish and develop if the, if the, 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 the good environment was conducive for full of peace and security. So, in other words, if you give them the same environment that you provide them in Europe, if you make it available in their home countries, they will still survive, and they will better survive. And it is better to help yourself create this kind of position, create this kind of uh, situation in their own countries, and definitely they will go back without any problems. Thank you very much indeed.